Hello, my name is John Spangle. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Underground. <coughs> Excuse me. Where I come up the title, I was thinking about the Underground Church in present-day China and Iran. Another place in this world where the Holy Spirit is expanding the body of Christ every day. We are in this last moments on this earth. I believe uh, it all has to do with Israel. They are in the Psalm 83 war, which started 7 October 2023. And the uh, main purpose was involved the... Uh, uh, Red heifers, and before this war uh, is over, as it states in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse one through eleven, as they say, "Peace and safety, we go up." And I believe after the the areas in Rafa, the last stronghold in in uh, Gaza, once that's taken out and they start moving in that area, that's when they're going to be thinking peace and safety, Israel. It's not when the UN says it or anybody else. It's when Israel says it. And at that point, that's when the sudden destruction comes because Iran knows that the Israel's already proved their superiority doing precise target attacks. So Iran knows they've already did attack a few weeks ago where they, they did the 300, which is a combination of missiles and, and uh, drones and everything else involved. Well, they know they... 99% of that was held back. So there's going to be a point where they're going to just going to send everything in. There's roughly estimated around uh, uh, 3,000 or more rockets in Hezbollah, uh, not counting what's in the West Bank. And so at some point, Iran and some of the other surrounding areas will go right to annihilate Israel. And I believe that's going to happen shortly after Hamas is taken out. So we have to wait and see how it plays out in the last moments here on Earth. Before then, we are raptured up. We know uh, the time, the seasons, and so uh, we know we are close as a body of Christ. Other people don't see it because they're not part of the body of Christ. And that's why I give everything I talk about is pre-tribulation rapture since uh, around September, October last year. I knew we were conver things were converging around September last year, but as things had progressed, I've done an intense study, and, and I'm just continuously every day, I know things happened yesterday. I didn't get a chance to make a video. Uh, that's the first time in months that I didn't get a video out every day. And so I'm sorry about that. I've had some health reasons. Some other things come up at the time. So actually I didn't get a video out yesterday. But today I'm, I was able to work all day and get a video. And hopefully tomorrow, hopefully I'll, I'll be better. I know I'm going to have to go to the doctor and do some more stuff later. And uh, I'm having some medical problems. So... There may be a time or two in the next week or two where I may not be able to make a video. But I want to be committed to God as be obedient as in make as many videos as I can. Because we are in these last moments. And that's why the severity of it. And uh, I know people make comments. I re complain. You know, I reuse uh, scriptures over and over. And some scriptures I add to it. Yes, I do. And I... I, I uh, different perspective. This video, I'm going to reuse some scripture, but then I got some brand new perspective that I really want to get into the study of the early church beyond before the 5th century, which I'm going to show you through an article I have found that I think is very informative about those talking about how pre-tribulation rapture was taught in the early church. We have the proof, it's just people don't look for it. Uh, I, I claim that people are spiritually lazy. That they'll listen to a you know, I want people to come here and get see what I show them, but but to take that and study on their own. Uh, and this is to be uplifting for people that already know. It just kind of reassures them. And yes, I'm having trouble with my speech. Um, I'm having trouble with my PTSD and my memory problems and cognition. So I apologize if my speech, especially in the next few days, is going to be giving me some problems. Um Yesterday I was really stuttering real bad. I couldn't do anything. So that's part of some of my health stuff. But uh, this is to be uplifting, to motivate people, give understanding. Uh, I'm, I'm not a young man myself, but I'm still learning. I'm a child of God. And this is what this is for. And I also do this to show that even someone as simple as me, God can use to uh, get to people. And that's what this is about. And there'll be people attacking and that's the reason why I, I did this one titled Pre-Tribulation Raptures is the Most Argued Doctrine. 
and why. But first off, I'm going to give the statement that I give a lot of times where we're at with the church, as in the church age. Church is not purified during the seven-year tribulation. Jewish people are. That's Daniel 9, 1 through 27. Explains the whole reason for the seven-year tribulation has nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ. The church is purified solely by the complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's John 17, 1 through 26. By saying there's no pre-tribulation rapture, then you're saying that Jesus Christ did not complete what he did on the cross. Uh, that is not true. He is our Lord and Savior. And by being a born-again Christian, we are saved by the gift of grace. How do you know you're born uh, are saved? I always go by ABCs of salvation. Admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus died and rose again to pay for your sins. And confess Jesus as Lord of your life, putting your total trust in Jesus as your only hope of salvation. Submitting to God. And that's where people fail. That's the reason why a lot of people aren't truly born again, because they do not submit themselves to God. They have to let go of this world. Be willing to walk away family members. Walk away friends. Walk away from them if they're incorrect. And people don't do that. You know, they're governed by their heart, by the flesh. And that's where people make mistakes. There's many people that are after the church, but they're not going to uh, go to heaven. I'm going to show that in scripture by Jesus Christ himself saying that. The church being under the gift of grace only. We have the gift of grace. We have our faith in Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross, and we are blessed by the gift of grace. And not the Jewish people. They don't have that. So they have to be faced being martyred to be with God during the seven-year tribulation, unless they endure to the end of the seven-year tribulation. Then you have the judgment, the wheats and tares in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark 13, talks about how they're separated at the end. That's what that's all about. It's not us. We're not part of that. Well, in a way, we're part of it because we're with Jesus Christ when he does the judgment. We help him judge. But we're not part of the, we're not here for the great, the great white throne judgment. We belong to the Bema seat judgment. It's a different judgment. When us born again believers, when we're raptured up, all right, pre tribulation rapture, when we go up, there's going to be a time of judgment where we go before Jesus Christ Himself. And it says, You test it by fire, you step in, and it's either smoke for wood, hay, and stubble, or a bright light for precious gems, meaning for what we are held accountable for everything we say and do in our body. Yes, we're, we're blessed. We're, we're, we're born again, so we're, we're saved. Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, absolutely. According to Scripture. People try to say that's not true. It's not. Those that seem to lose their salvation never had it. There's many people that act godly that are not. And that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. You're truly born again. That's it. No one can take you from God. Jesus is very, he's our shepherd and we're his sheep. And don't think he won't defend for you. All right, no one takes you from Jesus once you're born again. And so uh, uh, forever, forevermore we'll be with him. And as usual, I apologize. I lost my train of thought. Maybe they get back to me. There's a point I wanted to make. Uh, that can be confusing sometimes uh, with my memory issues. But uh, uh, born again, we're with Jesus Christ. And I apologize. I lost that. That's there somewhere. Maybe they come back to me later. So why is there so much preaching or confusion against the pre-tribulation rapture? Or well, Jesus Christ himself has the answer to that. I always love to talk about Christ, what he says. A lot of people, well, this, that, or this, I go by Christ. So he gives, starts out with the warning in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 51. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of son of man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. He gives you another warning. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So therefore, what are we to be? We are to be watchful. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, 
whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, and give them meat in due season. I believe that meat in due season, of course, meat being scripture, milk for a uh, early Christian, just born again, meat for the more mature Christian, uh, meat in due season. We're in the season right now. This is for a future event. This is our event. He's describing a pre-tribulation rapture. And so that's that's what this is all about. So it's a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine for this moment in time, right now, where we're at. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So anybody right now talking about pre-tribulation rapture, preaching about tribulation tri rapture, sorry about my words, teaching it, uh, explaining it to other people, you are well blessed for what you are doing because you are being correct and obedient to our Father in heaven. Now for those people who will talk against it or don't believe in it. But in it that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. In other words, they don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. That means uh, smite can also mean argue. So those that argue against it, those that uh, mock us, those that say it's foolish and it's not true, and also they that live for this world don't care. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and point him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that, like I said, that always refers, many times I've said before in videos, that refers to hell, weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're forever damned. So anybody that says there's no pre-tribulation rapture better correct himself. You say, why is this so strong? Because you're denying Jesus Christ when you do that. Anybody out there who, who says there's no pre-tribulation rapture, I don't care who it is. If you talk against this doctrine and say it's not there, you will answer to God because you're denying Jesus Christ coming for his bride. And therefore he will deny you for his father. It's very serious. I did a video making it in the past about being a salvation, kind of a salvation issue. And I've had so many people come at me. Oh, it doesn't matter what you think. It does matter what you think. That's the reason why very few people go to heaven. Because they won't stand up. They won't research. They won't look. They're spiritual lazy. It matters what you think. Don't be lukewarm. God spits out lukewarm Christians. Because that's exactly what you are if you're thinking, but it doesn't matter. It matters. Get on board. It's where you're going to spend your eternity. It matters. God doesn't play around. Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall come on all that dwell on the face of the earth, excuse me, that, that dwell on the face of the earth. Warning. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, as it says, counted worthy to escape. Everybody gets after me. Pre-tribulation rapture is escape theory. Absolutely. We don't have to be here for the seven-year tribulation. You want to be here for the seven-year tribulation? You're here for it. You get what you want. So that's what God does in judgment, seven-year tribulation. It's to bring the Jewish people back to obedience, but at the same time, it's for giving the unbelievers what they want. God will always give you what you want. He will always give you what you desire. If you desire hell, he'll give that to you. He'll warn against it, but he'll give it to you. He don't, he don't make you follow him. And if, if you don't want him, that's fine. You're not going to have him. And that's what these people are. They're too wrapped up in their lives. They're, too listen, they're listening to that person behind the pulpit and not correcting them if they're wrong or going by what that, or they're going by, well, I grew up in this church. This is what we're taught. So this is what I... My patches just woke up. He hears me. They don't, uh, my cat patches in the other room. They don't, uh, they won't look themselves. It's a daily walk. That's why very few people go because it's a daily walk. You have to take your time to do it. You have to push things aside. Now, some things happened yesterday. had a lot of stuff medically and some other stuff going on. Doctor's appointment. This, everything just took up my time. I was, I was upset because I got done with everything and I didn't get a chance to finish my study. So I was not happy about that. So today I was happy I've been able to spend hours studying. Things happen.
but the point is, you got to make that time. And that's the first time in five months that I didn't, you know, I didn't spend just a little time that day studying instead of hours. Today, it's right now it's 6.31. I'm making this video. I started this 7 o'clock in the morning studying and doing stuff, researching. That's how long I've been on it. It's been a great day. Rainy day. So what else? What else is there to do? Study God's Word. The parable of the ten virgins. This is what gets me more than anybody. People will try to twist this around, say it's not what it is. This is all about a pre-tribulation rapture, people. It's right in your face. Not only that, he's telling you about those, those people. They're involved in church. The ten wise and the ten foolish. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were five wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wives took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry, and made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. Go ye rather to them that sell, and buy it for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, unless they were ready, they were prepared for the pre-tribulation rapture. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut to be forever with God. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. So they're forever damned. Then he leaves with a warning. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. We know the exact day of the, his second coming. You know it's three and a half years after an Antichrist enters into and desecrates the temple. And it's the same time, seven years after he confirms the seven-year covenant. At the end, it's his second coming. We know this. All right. But this is when he comes in the clouds. It's not considered a second coming because he doesn't come to earth. So many people make such a big deal about he doesn't have two more second comings. No, people, let's stop being smart aleck because I have so many people do that. Mocking smart aleck, you know, think there's wise and show how foolish they are. He only has one second coming to earth, but he comes in the atmosphere. He doesn't touch on the earth when he comes for this bride. So it's not considered his second coming. Simple as that. Preacher of and Rapture Doctrine is a new teaching. Now, this is when I got into some articles and I was looking at some stuff. And then uh, I did a lot of research and I really liked this article by David Patterson. It was out a series of pre-tribulation rapture stuff that I'm looking at. And so I wanted to do this article first. But before I get into it, I'm going to talk uh, real quick, use some references. Jesus taught about pre-tribulation rapture. Matthew 24, 36 through 51. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Luke 21, 34 through 36. Mark 13, 32 through 37. Paul taught pre-tribulation pre rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 17. Also, you're going to read in, I'm going to read in this article. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, 200 AD. A scenes document about a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. Now, let's get into this article. It's very long, but it's very informative because it, it, it's showing the, the, the Darby uh, rapture, the story about Darby. Everybody gets that. It's a modern thing. I've just been taught recently about Darby in the 1830s, and rapture is not taught by the early church. I love when people are like that because I could go on documentation and look things up. So the rapture of pre -Darby, by pre-Darby uh, rapture by David Patterson. No, you didn't miss it. Neither did Darby. The article title was not suggesting that the rapture occurred before the days of John Nelson Darby, 1800-1882, but rather is pointing out that a belief in the rapture of the church, in particular a pre-tribulation rapture, existed and taught before Darby's birth. An example of the allegation that belief in a pre-tribulation rapture is relatively recent. I apologize. I have a baby in here sleeping on my chair. She's been fighting with patches. That's the reason why 
another reason why I want I want to come in here. Here's my voice, and they've been playing with with one of my other cats, so I got them separated. So I apologize for his loud voice. Sounds like my son's going to take care of him right now. Michael Bird wrote. The preacher of view did not appear on the scene of church history until J.N. Darby in the 1830s. In this article, we will examine some of the references in the biblical works predating Darby that either explicitly taught or appeared to teach a pre-tribulation rapture. So we'll start out with the early witnesses. After the time of the apostles, a number of writings indicate belief in the imminence of Christ's return, which is consistent with the pre-tribulationism climate of Rome, 35 to 101, Ignatius of Antioch died 110, the Deutsch, a late first century anonymous Christian treatise, the Epistle of Pseudo Barnabas, circa 70 to 130, and the Shepherd of Hermas, second century, all reference Christ's imminent return. Even though it appears that the apostolic fathers were largely post tribulation because they believe the persecution they were enduring was the tribulation itself. Understand that the first church was under great tribulation. Churches were always under great tribulation. I was just stated in a uh, video, uh, one or two videos ago, where uh, last year over 124,000, over 124,000 Christians had to leave their countries or be killed uh, worldwide. Where nearly almost 6,000 Christians last year were martyred alone. Uh, there's great persecution. I always mention China and Iran because those are the two number one countries where a lot of people are being killed for being a Christian. And so it's just give understanding. Uh, people need to open their eyes. A lot of times it's the people in the Western world that have no idea what's going on in other areas. They don't study. They're too wrapped up in their lives, and they're not really informative. As Christians, we are to be open to everything. We are to take the time to study, and we're to be responsible for our spirituality. That's what a mature Christian does. It's just not going to read a few scriptures every day and going to church uh, once or twice a week, and then you're good to go and live your life the way you want during the week. That's not it. And that's the reason why many are damned. They held to the doctrine of imminency. J. Barton Payne, a post-tribulist, concluded that belief in the imminence of the return of Jesus was the uniform hope of the early church. But it appears that Arrhenius Alliant, 120-202, was a pre-tribulist. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, and articulated his eschatological views in against Hermes, against heresies, book five. First, he referred to Enoch's translation and Elijah's being caught up as previews of the rapture. For Enoch, when he pleased God, it was translated in the same body in which he did please him, thus pointing out by anticipation the translation of the just. Elijah, too, was caught up when he was yet in the substance of the natural form, thus exhibiting in prophecy the assumption of those who are spiritual and that nothing stood in the way of their body, being translated and caught up. Second, Arrhenius refers to the church being caught up before the tribulation, and therefore when in the end of the church shall suddenly caught up from this, it is said that there shall be tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning, neither shall be. Matthew twenty four twenty one. For this is the last contest of the righteous, in which when they are overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. Uh, when he's referring to is uh, Enoch, Genesis chapter 5, 21 to 24, and Hebrews 11, 5. Uh, especially in Hebrews 11, 5, it says four times how uh, Enoch was uh, translated. And Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 11, when it talks about him being taken up. Victorinus, uh, Pet and I'm sorry I butchered his name, a Petrovium died 304, was a bishop in modern Slovenia, martyred during Diocletian's reign. In his commentary on Revelation 6:14, he writes, "And the heaven withdrew as a scroll that's rolled up for the the heaven for the heap to be rolled away. That is, the church shall be taken away." Later, while explaining Revelation 15, he writes, "And I saw another great and wonderful sign: seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is completed the indignation of God." For the wrath of God always strikes the obstinate people with seven plagues. That is perfectly as it is said in Leviticus, and these shall be in the last time, when the church shall have gone out of the mist. Therefore, victorious believe the church would be raptured before the breaking of the seventh seal, and therefore before the seven trumpet judgments and the seventh bowl judgments, making him at least what we refer to as a pre-wrath in his theology. 
In a sermon entitled On the Last Timer, the Antichrist and the End of the World, Syrian church father Sodu Ephraim, 4th to 6th century, wrote, For all the saints of elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. The gathering pseudo Ephraim mentions appears to be a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I had talked about him before uh, in, in the Syrian uh, church about the Ephraim in a video a while back showing some other things of his writings. And so he had uh, uh, written a lot about pre-tribulation rapture. So now we look at the Middle Ages. Immediately, the influence of Aaron and Austin, I mean Augustine was successful in turning the establishment church to a belief in Amenalism by around the 5th century. This view would dominate the medieval people with the title with little known exceptions. However, one exception was the apostate brethren in northern Italy. This new and thus persecuted celestial, celestial order eventually numbered in the thousands and evidently held a pre-tribulation rapture position. In 1360, an anonymous treaty entitled The History of Brother Dulcino articulated some of the beliefs of the apostate brethren. Their leader, Brother Dalcino, believed he and his followers would be taken to heaven and protected from the actions of the Antichrist before later descending back to earth, this holding to a belief in the pre-tribulation rapture. So like it states, uh, in the early church, like Augustine and, uh, and Origen, that's when Satan worked through them to get away from the pre-tribulation rapture teaching, which is around close to the Middle Ages. It's when they try to get, get that out of the way. Satan has always been in the church from the beginning. And if you hear Patches running around with a weird noise, that's when he's got his toy mouse and he runs him down the hallway. That's my buddy. And the archives open. Johannes Gothenburg's movable type printing press in the 15th century made books more widely acceptable. Now, I have the uh, New Testament 1526 edition uh, by William Tundell. Now, William Tundell <coughs> used this to get the New Testament to the common man. And because of this, the Catholic Church tortured him and burned him at the stake. Uh, I always talk against the Catholic Church. I have people that are dear to me. My best friend's Catholic. I grew up near a Catholic town. Uh, but uh, the Catholic Church is, is nothing Christian about it. And those involved in part of the Catholic Church will not go to heaven. I used to, because I knew so many people, you know, be like, well, maybe they're they're in the Catholic Church. and but They understand and born again. But then I realized, no, because if they were born again, the Holy Spirit would put enough on them to get them out of there. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It guides you in your, in your teachings. Uh, it guides you in where you're learning, your scripture reading. And that's what the indwelling of the Holy Ghost does. So if you have something you quite don't understand it, you'll be guided. He will help you. But at the same time, he'll get you away from something you shouldn't be near. Yes, yeah, someone could be born again. Then, bam, go up the pre-tribulation rapture not even had that understanding because they just become born again. As I say, the milk of a child compared to the meat of an adult. There's a time where you're just fresh as a Christian. There's a lot to learn. Even Paul taught pre-tribulation rapture to the early church right off the bat, new believers. But if someone's in a position or been going to the church and, and become truly born again, uh, over time, they would be out of that church. They would leave. With more Bibles accessible to read and study, more biblical works were printed, especially following the Protestant Reformation. Many of these works were shelved and have been gathering dust in the antiquity sections of libraries across the world for centuries. But within the last two decades, some of these works have been converted to digital and thus searchable formats. One Christian historian, William Watson, has taken advantage of these available works spending hundreds of hours reading and searching Puritan writings from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. A simple word search for rapt, rapture and left behind yielded at least two dozen findings from notable authors such as Increase Mather, Cotton Mather, Philip Doddridge, and John Gill. Unquestionably, some of these uses of rapture by these writers refer to the act of being taken up to heaven. A few examples of William Watson's findings will have to suffice given the length of this article. William Sherwin, 1607 and 1687. Minister at Wellington wrote, The saints at the sounding of that last trumpet at the end of the world shall be changed in a moment at the twinkle of an eye, wrapped 
to meet up to Christ in the air. He even refers to the early church fathers agreeing with him. This doctrine that many of the ancient fathers acknowledged, Justin, Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and even Augustine sometimes held it. Though by the subtly of Satan forging lies to dispense the millinery opinion and stirring up men to foist in offensive errors, and these latter times hath again discovered it. After so many hundred years of its lying hid for the most part in the church, to be a doctrine really embraced by his faithful people, who knows it's his faithful people, the born again, who will doubtless certainly know that upon their rapture to meet Christ, they shall be perfect, be per perfected in glory evermore in heaven. So these last moments on this earth, this has come to understanding of uh, how God's opening things up to his people and letting us know. Boston Puritan Increase Mather, 1639-1723. Father of Cotton Mather wrote, When Christ comes, believers shall see the king in all his glory and shall go with him to the land that is very far off. Heaven is the land that is very far off. Christ is a sure believer shall, shall be thus, John 14.2. He will not come back to heaven and leave them behind. No, they shall sit with him in heavenly places. Later they shall come down from heaven. They shall be with him when he comes to judge the world. Morgan Edwards, 1722 to 1795. Helped found Rhode Island College, which eventually became Brown College. While a student of Bristol Baptist Seminary, he set forth the very clear pre-tribulation rapture belief. The dead saints will be raised in a living change at Christ appearing in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4:17. And this will be about three years and a half before the millennium. But will, we, but will he and they abide in the air at that time? No, they will ascend to paradise or to some one of those man, many mansions in the Father's house, John 14, 2. And so disappear during the foresaid period of time. The design of this retreat and disappearing will be to the judge, the risen, and changed saints. Edward's reference to the three and a half does not mean that he was a mid-tribulationist. His writings indicate he believed the total duration of the tribulation period to be not seven years, but three and a half. There's many references to the seven years being shortened uh, because it refers to if the days weren't shortened, the elect, they wouldn't survive. I disagree with that. I don't see it being from seven years to three and a half years. I believe it's Jano said that, you know, Gabriel told him and, and uh, the uh, what he saw. Uh, his vision was seven years. First part, three and a half. Second part, three and a half. I believe that's the whole thing. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding going around that when it talks about the days being shortened, it's not the length, it's the amount of daytime. There's a lot of references to the sun not shining before that time and the, and things going dark. You're not going to be killing during the night. You're killing during the day. And I believe that's why my God allows that to happen. The shortening of the sun during daylight during the day, I would venture to say quite a bit. You know, I mean, down to just maybe four hours a day, just to throw something out there. That's speculation on the amount of hours. But I mean, really, I think it will be so dark that uh, there won't be as much, there'll be a point where they, they won't do as much killing. And so uh, I believe that's what the sh uh, shortening of days, where he was going by what some people think that the seven years are shortened. Uh, because if I didn't know one was going to make it through the seven-year tribulation. And that the body of Christ is not there. That's the two things we agree on no matter what. Pre-tribulation rapture. Because it's all throughout the Bible. There are far too many references to the rapture in Watson's published findings to articulate here. He cites Thomas Collier, John Askell, Robert Matton, John Archer, James Duran, Jeremiah Burroughs, Archbishop James Usher, and dozens of others. The archives have opened in an allegation. That belief in the rapture did not appear until Darby in the 1800s simply don't hold. So many of these guys make a big deal about, oh, the 1800 Darbys. I get, I've got tons of communications. I always talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, 200 AD, where they talk about uh, document that pre tribulation rapture was taught by early church. That's why I throw back at them. That's quick. But there's more. There's so much out there. But the problem with these people is they're listening to other people, you know. I'm overwhelmed by a lot of people that come here. This is all about God. This whole thing's about God and for God. In these last moments on earth, that's why I do this. Uh, take my limited, I'm not scholarly, man, but I'm learning, researching and stuff and trying to put in, make videos, give the information out. Yes, I repeat a lot of stuff, you know, because there's new people here. 
You know, I don't know who's coming here. There's such an inpouring of people and leaving. I'll get high numbers. Then I have 10 people leave. Then I have 11 to 12 people come back. Then I have five people come in, I mean, come in. And then I'll have one or two or three leave. And it's just back and forth. Probably they see a video. They don't like me saying something. They just, I'm done subscribing. That's fine. You know, God brings them here to hopefully see something. And how I know it's being effective is I see so many videos are shared, which shocks me because I didn't think anybody would share any of my videos. And and I'm it's just overwhelmed. And because I'm not very articulate and I have trouble with my speech, my memory, and I get nervous making these videos because I'll, I'll start and I'll, I try to write notes because I, I'll do something and I'll forget if I want a point to get to you. And to me, that's frustrating, you know, because it's important or I didn't need to, to get that point across. And so uh, I have to be careful. And a lot of times during the day, I, I get tired and just do my studies and it's just, just what I have to deal with. But it's so important right now. That's why I do this. It's where are those last moments? And God will guide his sheep. Jesus, our shepherd, we are his sheep. He will guide. The born again will come to him. That's why I talk about the parable of ten virgins all the time. There's many people active. There's people active who could even be leaving Bible study groups and not born again. And that's what people don't understand. You know, what's your reasoning behind stuff? Is it that or is it the attention? You'd be surprised how many times people just do something that's like socially, it's attention and things, but but and my people spend hours on videos and it's like they're not it's unreal. Uh, you know, there's certain people I'll talk, I'll throw out there because they put a lot of stuff. I, I pray all the time for Joel Richardson, but he's so much against the pre tribulation rapture. He has a lot of knowledge, wrote a lot of books. And I'm like, man, this this man is lost. And anybody that uh, talks against the pre-tribulation rapture is lost. Appreciating Darby's contribution. They always talk, try to use Darby bad, but actually Darby was good. Although there are many references to the rapture, some pre-tribulation by published works before his time, we simply do not know if John Nelson Darby was influenced by these works. His writings articulating a pre-tribulation rapture should not be minimized, but fully appreciated. We are indebted to him for his enormous contribution to the subject, setting it forth in a clearer way to a wider 19th century audience and beyond. Darby did not invent this teaching, nor did the many who taught it prior to his time. He taught it, and they taught it, because the Bible teaches it. It's all throughout the Bible. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's very clear. The story of Noah. It's a, it's a rapture story. No, he didn't get raptured up to heaven, but he was he saved before judgment. That's what pre rapture is all about. We're saved. We don't have to worry about the judgment on this earth. You know, we are judged different because we are faithful to God. And because of our faith, we're automatically saved by the gift of grace. We go through the beam of seat judgment, whether we get rewards or not. But what matters is we're with God for eternity. And that's what I look forward to. Especially now because I'm really having a lot of health issues and it's it's getting bad. So uh, they, I'm working with the VA about some stuff and it's pretty bad. Uh, those against pre tribulation rapture doesn't or don't seem to recognize the use of Revelation 19. They seem to forget this. This is this is the one uh, area in the Bible. It's like uh, how obvious. I mean, I look at Matthew 24 and say it's obvious. But this, it's obvious. The marriage feast in heaven. Revelation 19, 7 through 10. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made her ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in what? Fine white linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's the reason why you wear the fine white linen. It represents uh, the purity. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are them which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren. Thou gave testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what verses comes right after this? It says, talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. 
we go before the Bema seat of Jesus Christ, right? Before the wedding feast, we have the Bema seat. Excuse me, my sign says. We have the Bema seat judgment. And then there we have rewards or not. And some of those rewards are crowns. And what do you do? You bless, you give honor to who it belongs to, Jesus. You lay it at his feet. There's other scripture talks about us laying crowns at his feet. When you talk about the 24 elders, how we know they're men, they came out of the pre-tribulation rapture, saints, because it talks about how they laid their crowns at Jesus' feet. All that takes place before. So he's our, we've, you know, it's, it's, you've had the wedding feast, you had the judgment, you had the wedding feast, and now he's getting ready. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself, and was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the, the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in what? Fine linen, white, and clean. What's the linen represents? The righteousness, the testimony of those who follow Christ. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with he should smite the righteous, the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and tread the winepress of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. King of kings, Lord of lords. Yes, two, two locations. A lot of people are like, he didn't have anything marked. He don't have a tattoo on his leg. Yes, he does. He has something on his vesture and on his thigh. It wouldn't rec recognize on his thigh unless it was two different locations. And people can argue back and forth about that. There's so much there. There's so much proof. And yet people don't see it. And it's because you have to be born again to see it. That's the issue. I've, I've talked in many videos. It's like, how can this person seem like a godly person, but they don't, they're not born again? Only the born again go up. So therefore, only the born again see it. That's how, you know, by fruits of labor, someone's a born again Christian or not. Especially if they're talking against the pre-tribulation rapture so much. Oh, it's not true. And you're being foolish. And that. They're not born again. They will not see it. They cannot. They're not allowed. That's why there's such an argument and why it's most argued doctrine within the church. Because most of the church doesn't go to heaven. And that's an eye opener. That's what people don't get. They look at this person here. I sit with them in, by, in the pew. We do this every Sunday and they're such nice people. You're judging by the heart. You don't know what their heart is. You don't know what they're doing. That person could seem like a great person, may not be true. I know uh, my wife talks about, we talked about the abuse and her two cousins that they dealt with and their family for many years. By what? By an uncle, great uncle, who was very active in church. I, I remember that conversation sitting there with her grandmother at the table and I was drinking my tea because I don't drink coffee. She fixed me tea, hot in, and she drank her coffee. And she, she said she, all them years, she just couldn't, couldn't see him doing what he was doing to them girls. He abused them for many years. And the girls tried to tell people in the family, but they couldn't see because he was such a very active Christian man. How many are like that? You don't know the hearts of a person. We don't even know our true own hearts. That's just why a lot of times I pray to God daily for I'm not deceived and that I'm correct. Because God knows me better than I know my own self. Because we will allow, because of our flesh, allow ourselves to be deceived. And many are. We're in that time of deception. You know. So I hope this gives understanding. Uh, and and uh, gives you an opportunity to study and, and motivates you to look yourself. But when these people say Darby, uh, it just gets me how, how they, they do that. And then, like I said, chapter 19. You know, everybody argues against there's no, and they talk about uh, Revelation chapter 20, which talks about the modern saints. I'm thinking about doing a video again about talking about the saints, pre-tribulation saints and, and uh, seven-year tribulation saints, the difference. There's difference. They are saints, but there's a difference between the saints. Uh, there'll be saints that come out of the seven-year tribulation. Yes, they're not us. They're not the church. Different group of people. That's where people make mistakes. There's different groups with different things. Now, sometimes God, you know, Jesus was talking about the Jewish people. 
Gentiles people and those together, Jewish and Gentiles, which are the body of Christ. Different groups. I understand, for what I understand, those Gentiles had an opportunity to be saved would mostly be the descendants of Ishmael. You have Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac, Jewish people, have their, their 12 million Jews, their there will be the veil, the curse will be lifted off them. They'll have understanding. They can come to know to Christ. And those Gentiles uh, are the descendants of Ishmael that might, will have an opportunity to come to Christ. Now, as in Matthew 25, the ten virgins, those people who preached against pre tribulation rapture or who doesn't believe, didn't accept the gospel, uh, they don't get a second chance. That's the, the misinformation, the Left Behind series books I talk about against all the time. It's fiction. Uh, there's no second chance. People say, well, God is a, but they've had their opportunity. God's also God of judgment. You know, look at Lot and his family. Another rapture type story where they were given the chance to get out for the destruction. That's what rapture is all about. So as they're leaving, uh, the night before, Lot was told to go to his sons-in-laws, plural, so at least two or more, and they would have been married to his daughters, they were his sons-in-laws, to go talk to them, and he was mocked. So he left sons and sons-in-laws and daughters, because the two daughters that went with him out of Sodom weren't married. And they returned not, not to look back. Don't yearn for them. Lot's wife did. What happened to her? Turned to a pillar of salt. She didn't go to heaven. She yearned for her family, the city she was born in. She was a sodomite. Lot went mar uh, went there, met her there, and married her there. She was a sodomite, natural uh, person of that, that city. So those left behind, they don't get it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, where it talks about after we go up, the Antichrist comes about, and... Uh, how God sends a strong delusion for those that uh, dare to live unrighteously. In other words, those that were worldly. He sends them a delusion. They don't know they're deluded. I've had people tell me, well, if you get raptured, I'll understand and I'll learn. No, you won't. You won't know I'm raptured. God sends a delusion. And uh, that's the time of the great deception. And they're deceived and don't even know they're deceived. That's the thing about deception. There's people now deceived. There's people coming to this channel saying stuff. They're deceived and don't even know it. But they, they sure comment to me and say evil things about me. I've been called a child of Satan. I've been all sorts of stuff because they don't see it. And sometimes I'll put comments to, on different things to see, guide them. But uh, it is what it is. You can't, you can't make them have salvation. They got to they gotta want it themselves. They got to seek out God. It's an individual daily walk. So God bless you. Thank you.